Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I am delighted again to be able to speak to Ken Watton of Gresham House, one of the UK's finest small and mid-cap investors. So welcome, Ken. Hi, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me back. Well, when we last spoke sort of five to six months ago, you were pretty bullish on stocks like I was, but uh, <laughs> I think we got that wrong with the uh, with, with higher inflation expectations, tightening central banks, and now um, obviously that curveball from uh, uh, Putin with the Ukraine and, um, and Russia. So what's your sort of outlook for equities for the rest of the year and beyond? Well, look, I think... You know, I, I, when we spoke last time, I was I was bullish in that I, I could see some really exciting small company opportunities. But you know, we're, we're we're bottom up stock pickers, so I'm always excited about about something. There's always there's always there's always a company which is sort of overlooked and, and interesting and where we think there's a good opportunity. And um, what I've been saying for got you know, at least eighteen months has been we are anticipating periods of of heightened market volatility and you know, just just inevitable on, on the back of the, the sort of you know, second third order impacts of the pandemic and, and as we return to some sort of normality just the sort of aftershocks and I think the, the current issues with supply chain disruption and, and rising inflation are, are exactly that they're, they're the aftershocks of the pandemic so it shouldn't be a, a huge surprise to people but clearly it, it does have you know, these these things do have the the, the consequence of sentiment becoming quite wobbly for, for periods. So, you know, the, I would expect that to continue for, for, for quite some time, for, probably for the rest of the year. Um, and, and clearly, big geopolitical issues like like Russia and Ukraine are not are not helpful. But and, and mainly, it's, it's the uncertainty which is the, the, the real killer. So, I think you know, that, that that uncertainty layered on top of other sort of more, more kind of company fundamentals based bits of uncertainty I think is just a recipe for, for volatility and then if you if you overlay that with you know, the fact that company market estimates are probably as uncertain as they've as they've been for sort of at least a decade and um, because of all the, the sort of uh, the, the knock-on effects of the pandemic I just think the, the prospects for companies both missing and, and indeed beating the market estimates are, are greater now than they would normally be. And, and that again leads to, to volatility at the stock level. So you know that creates a lot of challenges. But you know, perhaps I perhaps sort of counter to what you would expect, I, I'm still pretty bullish because the, the, the volatility you see actually does create a lot of opportunities. You get high quality companies which temporarily get impacted and that means that they uh, the market overreacts and, you, and there's an opportunity to buy them at, at, attractive prices if you're taking a long-term view which is what we try to do so you know it's it's not all bad i guess is my, my message no, I'm, I'm actually with you i mean I, I view it such that if the market goes down it throws out lots of potential um, instances and stocks great companies to buy at much better prices and actually that means it sets it up for going forward to be a much better way of making returns but i'm going to ask you an unfair question so apologies for this in advance what's the probability that uh, russia invades ukraine and if they do what does that mean for the stock market and how long is it likely to last <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so as, as, as a UK small cap fund manager, I'm not sure how, how qualified I am to, to, to give an opinion on on on, uh, on on Russia's propensity to invade. But <laughs> no, I think whether or not there's an, there's an actual full blown invasion, I think you know, the, the, the tension is unlikely to, to, to be released anytime soon. I think um, you know, I guess my my, my sort of personal view is. I don't expect there to be full-scale war, but I do expect there to be incursions and probably some annexation of, of, of sort of territory, plus you know, cyber attacks and, and you know, generally a, 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 a number of initiatives to try and destabilize the government of Ukraine because that's what suits um, Russia's sort of um, wider strategic aims. And I think it's going to be you know, there's going to be tension and there's going to be news about it and there's going to be sort of mini issues continuing um but on the other hand I, you know, I, was, listening, I, was, I was reading something uh, the, the other day sort of highlighting that in 1980 uh, the, the Soviet Union put 400,000 troops on the border of Poland when when uh, Lech Wałęsa and, and Solidarity were, were sort of uh, uh, getting traction in, in Poland and destabilizing that 
uh, regime, which was which was uh, a part of the Warsaw Pact. And I think yeah, that that's a significant order of magnitude, a greater number of, of military personnel there then than than, uh, than there is now in Ukraine. And you know, nuclear war was avoided in in 1980. So I think everyone would do their absolute best to, to try and de-escalate. I suspect that. You know, Russia won't go for a full-scale invasion because of the consequences, but you know, the, the uncertainty and the um, and, and sort of more minor issues will continue for, for quite some time. And that's and actually, if anything, that's aside from the human cost of, of, of this, the the ramifications for stock markets mean ongoing uncertainty continues yeah. to drive volatility. I, I, I can't see it sort of easing up anytime soon. I would agree. I think actually it's in Putin's advantage, isn't it, to to draw it out as long as it lasts? Because I mean, their biggest export is oil and gas, and uh, as long as they don't get embargoed themselves and sanctions, then they can sell their gas into Germany and the rest of Europe at a higher prices than they would otherwise. So it makes yeah, it makes yeah. a lot of sense for them just to carry on throwing spanners into or not saying anything, actually pretending that uh, they're not going to invade, saying they're not and everybody believing that they are and putting troop movements. At, uh... But just just more broad, broad, broad picture in terms of sort of investors. I mean, I know a lot of small and mid cap investors and uh, and private shareholders and stuff like that have been um, have been struggling with the emotions. How best do you sort of like or professionals manage that sort of like um, psychological side of investing as the markets continually grind you lower? No, I think it, it, it's hard, but I think one of the one of the things that sets apart good investors from from less good ones is is the ability to be dispassionate and not you know, try try to take some emotion out of the decisions you make, not get sort of wedded to stocks that, that you liked before in a different environment and just try try to constantly reappraise what, what you're doing and, and look at the opportunity set that you have now, not what, what you wish it was but, um, if, if certain things hadn't happened. I think you know, you know, I've always sort of as a person been been quite pragmatic. So yeah, I, I, there are certain stocks you fall in love with because you think that it's got a fantastic business model, all the management team are, are, are great, the opportunity is great, you get really, really excited. But I've always been pretty good at being prepared to change my mind if circumstances change or if, if uh, you know, the, the, some of the characteristics you thought were the case turn out to be different to, to, to the original thesis. And I think it's really important to go through the process of of regular re-evaluation and, and in our team you know, we've got a decent team resource we've got you know, six of us in our public equity team we've also got now 20 people in our our private equity team and we try to work very closely together with we, we build that that crossover of public private market um perspective and, and capability and touch points it just gives you a better breadth of of insight across, across businesses and so you, you, you know, talk to a private equity colleague who, who really understands the sector and you know, that that's a very useful counterpoint to, to sort of get past the market noise and the sentiment and the short termism that you sometimes find in public markets and just really try to focus on the fundamentals. So we try to use that resource that we've got internally to get somebody different, someone with a slightly different perspective to have a look at some of the investment just to, just to give us a fresh point of view. And then the other thing we always try to do, and again, try to regularly reappraise this, not just do it when we're first, first looking at a company, is to get external operator perspective. So we've got a pretty extensive um, private equity network that sits around the Gresham House strategic equity business. And you know, we always try to use, the, you know, try to find somebody in that network who's an expert in a particular sector or situation, or who has first-hand operator or market participant level insight or knowledge rather than general fund manager knowledge and to, to test our judgments and make sure we're not getting carried away or that we haven't missed something and we've, we've thought about the risks properly and we've you know we, we we understand the business model or the opportunities set from from a number of different directions so we try to triangulate and it, it, that 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 idea of always testing your judgments with people who probably know more than you do i think is a really good sort of way of making sure you, you don't get overexcited about the, the the opportunities where the market's roaring and you don't get overly depressed when the market is going down and you just try, try to try to balance and think about the long-term business momentum which ultimately ought to drive the stocks in the long term yeah no I, mean, I totally agree i think that's a great piece of um just general sort of advice that uh yeah speak to other people who are 
probably better positioned than you, than oneself and can take a more objective view in terms of they haven't got the money inside of an actual yeah company. but particularly where those who are not so in in the somewhat you know, the bubble yeah. of the uk uk equity markets and uh, speak to brokers and analysts and other fund managers and commentators that that that's that's useful we should always kind of have that perspective in, in mind but speaking to people who don't think about shares they think about companies and, and, and business fundamentals i think it's a good good way of anchoring or how, how you think about things yeah well i did see actually you put some money to just recently or gresham has into a couple of ipos uh okay. winwood which is a uh, ai powered SaaS platform sort of like uh, yeah. for predictive sort of intelligence for risk management of marines and ships and stuff like that and likewise yeah. with Aptamer, which is a uh, a new sort of like uh, next generation technology that replaces um, antibodies, I think, in medicine yeah. and the research. So, do you want to take us through? Uh, do you want to take us through Winwood first? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> and Win Winwood, that, that, that's a, as you say, it's a recent IPO that we invested in, um, just just the back end of last year. Mm. Um, really exciting business, um, applying artificial intelligence technology. A kind of big data analytics, uh, a big buzzwords which have sort of yeah. got people excited over the last few years. Um, but applying that to the, the global shipping maritime industry, which, despite being you know, a huge market and you know, pivotal to all sorts of elements of global trade, actually in terms of its use of data and and uh, you know, it, it's quite behind the curve. So this this business. Um, it's, it's run by, it's founded by some ex-Israeli Navy um, uh, people. So they people who, as they put it, they've actually been on the water and smelled the salt, and mm. uh, so so they under they know they, they understand kind of some of the real physical dynamics of, 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 of that market. Um, and you know, it, it's initially the, the technology has been used to try and um, support homeland security and and, and regulators. So. If you if you have data about where a ship's come from, where it's going to, what type of vessel it is, what you know, what what cargo it's got, and and then you have data about weather patterns and typical shipping routes, stuff, you you can you, you use their algorithms to do predictive analysis on what that ship ought to be doing, what most ships that have those characteristics ought to be doing. If they then does something different, you can't explain that by weather or other disruption or something else that you know about that. Environment, then you know, that that creates a risk factor. You know, is this business trying to breach sanctions and deal with you know, you know, get cargo to Venezuela or for, you know, a, a, a jurisdiction which has been been banned by by certain certain countries regulators? So, and and then we can you can tell with the, the GPS signals we switched off for a period, or it's gone near to another ship. And then they also have data on ownership of, and, and registration of the of the vessel. So there's lots of things they can triangulate with, with the analytics that they've got. They can you know, use use that data to, to spot anomalies. As, uh, my, the analogy I'd use is, uh, is cybersecurity mm. uh, technology where, where they're, 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 they're pattern recognizing and where when something is different to what you would expect, that raises a flag which then sort of allows people to check whether or not there's been a cybersecurity breach. So it's similar, but in, you know, in a different environment. Then they can then take that 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 information, that knowledge, and that capability, and then apply it to other applications. So, if you're Nike and you've got you know, containers on, on on a ship somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, and you want to know when it's going to arrive, and you want to either be able to optimize the route, or you want to be able to tell your customers when when the when when it's going to arrive, you, know, you can use the data for that instead. So, and, and increasingly, there's opportunities to uh, for uh, freight forwarders to measure their carbon footprint by, by working out how many miles they've got and optimize the route. So there's, there's all sorts of applications for this tech, this core technology, which and they they just got a first mover advantage in applying that kind of sophisticated uh, data analysis and, and, and AI technique to to a market which just ha hasn't really used it before, um, surprisingly, but they, but it hasn't. So it's got vast a vast sort of array of potential applications. It's a huge market. It's, you know, it can provide solutions which are either business critical because of regulatory requirements, or um, you know, can save the ROI is massive because they can they can sort of optimize um, you know, what is an extremely expensive sort of component of, of lots of industries and and uh, help to do it better. So you know, really really exciting. Um, yeah, yeah been, I would I would certainly think about um, sort of like um, supply chain. Given the supply chain disruption we've had in the bottlenecks. 
yeah, for if you're a, a manufacturer or, or, <clears throat> or a customer and waiting for their shipment to come over, then to be able to, one, not only streamline your supply chains as you take advantage as soon as it gets docked, you can get the product and then put it to, to customers, also improves customer service. Plus, it also <clears throat> allows you to reduce your, um, you know, your, your stock holdings and stuff like that. And then I guess for regulators, yeah, embargoes of people like, um, you know, despotic states like uh, Iran. And then yeah. likewise, I'm guessing you've got lots of pirates and stuff around Africa, the African horn and stuff like that. So that would be used for risk management as well. So, yeah, I've got that one. What about um, App Tamer? Because that's a really sort of like... Um, Auto or antibody sort of manufacturer, <clears throat> as I understand it, is a well over a hundred billion dollar worldwide market and growing quite quickly because it's used in diagnostics, also in new sort of like leading edge treatments for immunotherapies and all kinds of different stuff and for for treatments afterwards. And this is a sort of like a, a replacement for it, isn't it? It's a sort of a, is it a chemically de derived type of um antibody that is much easier to manufacture and more consistent yeah of course so i mean Altima is a um as you say it's, a, it's effectively a platform for the production of, of synthetic antibodies which can then be used in diagnostic testing or can mm. be used in in, uh, in 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 drug development processes and um it's, it's a business it's, it's a relatively early stage business but um and it's one that we we invested through our our Barons Mead Venture Capital Trust funds, which are hybrid funds that do oh well done. Yeah, well, they, 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 they do they do private they do private private assets yeah. and they do sort of very small aim, aimlessly companies. So this is in the latter category, but um, it, it fits in into a sort of thematic area we think is really exciting, um, and, and it's an area that we've been trying to find opportunities both public and private across our our business. And there's an area where we've we've, we've invested a lot of time and effort to try and map the market, re research the opportunities that we think are going to be exciting within that market, and, and also to build a pretty extensive network of, of sort of expertise with, with, within um, both the private and public market contacts that we have to try and sort of give us high conviction when, we, when we're making investments, and we're doing that both in, in public markets, you know, right up to um, you know, FTSE 250 companies like UDG Healthcare, for example, which got taken out last year, where, where we sort of used our, our, our sort of pharmaceutical and healthcare services network to, to help us to really build conviction there, right down to pretty small private companies. So Aptima, uh, it, it plays into that uh, you know, that theme, and the theme is really um, in increasing the amount of outsourcing in terms of components of the drug discovery process. Um, you know, huge amounts of, of money being spent on it um, by, by, by big pharma companies and, and biotech businesses that have raised lots of money over the last few years, um, but an increasing propensity to sort of stick to the knitting from those businesses and to outsource components of that, that process to, um, to people who have ex expertise in that area. So uh, Aptima is, is um, you know, it's, it falls into that category. So it's, it's got this sort of leading edge platform in developing synthetic antibodies, um, that that's, that synthetic antibodies are taking share from from the traditional antibodies because they can be manufactured in such a way that they have the right characteristics for the testing that's required, um, and um, and they they have they're easier to produce, they're easier to store. Um, you get better consistency in terms of the yield, um, and you can and, and particularly important, they can they're, they're more effective at binding with what they need to bind to when when, yeah. when you're in the process. So. You know, we we think this is a an emerging area which is you know effectively playing into a very significant tailwind in terms of directional travel of spend in, in the wider sector and, and through our network of, of, of experts, particularly in some of the private companies we've invested in, we're able to really kind of kick the tires on on this area as a sort of one which is particularly exciting and sort of uh, we, we think has multiple years of growth opportunity. So you know, it, it's, it's relatively early stage for us in terms of the context of what, what we would typically do, but we, we have high conviction that this is a, a sort of winning area. Mm. Yeah, another one in the sort of like um, the healthcare space that you've done pretty well on, and I guess it's sort of run the winners, is um, is Alliance Pharma. I think it's a sort of £570 million uh, market cap business, sort of does uh, consumer healthcare brands like Lipsol and Ambisol and 
a moisturizer and stuff like that. Do you yeah. want to, how are you viewing that? Obviously, you've done very well over over long term, and it's sort of like, are you going to just continue to hold it because it's a winner? And you, what, what actually, you? No, no, interestingly, we have actually just just fully exited. The, the, oh, have the, you? The, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why, so why have you sold your position? Because yeah, so, so, as you say, we've done very well over over, over the long term. So this is a this has been a, a core holding within strategic equity capital, our investment trust, um, over the last few years. And um, as you say, it's done very well. It's been uh, a, a platform that has been quite quite smart at identifying under under commercialised. Um, products and then sort of either either bought the products or bought the licenses to distribute the products in, in certain jurisdictions and then just given them more focus than the previous owners had so it might be uh, you know, drugs which have, have just been uh, you know they're, they're, they're non-core products in in larger pharmaceutical mm. portfolios and and just haven't sort of been the priority for, for marketing investment for example so they've done a great job of of, of acquiring port, building a portfolio and then sort of applying their marketing expertise to to, to try and drive sales in those products, and, and um, as a result of that, the business has gone from you know being somewhat unloved and not very well understood business trading on a pretty low multiple to to, to mm. drive driving material growth and being sort of re-rated material over the last few years, and and, and now sort of rated for as, as a an attractive growth stock with some some really interesting assets. And I think um, you know, we, we've I think. From memory, we we delivered a 30 30 odd percent IRR on yeah. our investment in the stock. So it's been well a great, done. it's been it's been, a, it's been a great a, a great investment. But in in line with our, our strategy for that fund, which is a concentrated portfolio, so we we only have twenty holdings of which sort of the majority of the value is in the top ten, where we're taking you know, bigger positions and and trying to be actively engaged with the companies. So it's in the category of. We've owned it for a long time. It's done very well. It's now a larger market cap. Our, our level of influence is is sort of less significant, and frankly, we've, we've, we we saw better opportunities to redeploy the capital into into businesses that, that, that fit the strategy. Which is really about at the point of investment, companies between 100 and 300 million market cap, where we can build a meaningful equity stake, and where we can then leverage our internal resource our private equity capability and our network to try and help those businesses in whatever way is relevant to, to, to try and drive value and so that you know, we, we kind of don't think we can do that to, to any great degree anymore in, in in alliance and there's other opportunities where we can redeploy to where, where we think there's better upside yeah is, is there a danger when you go from sort of like a stock that you know and very familiar with and have done you know obviously very well over a year over the years so your risk for that particular stock in terms of knowledge and information base and familiarity and comfortable with your management team is, is pretty low relatively to then go into a new stock that is is is, is, is basically higher risk is is it is, is there an arbitrage on that risk so it needs to the, the new stock needs to have a disproportionate level of upside to justify well, I, mean, I mean i think that, that absolutely that you know, the fund management game is about sort of risk reward trade off mm. and trying to make the right get the right balance between the two and and you know i think you know, at, at, at a certain size and valuation and sort of view of the prospects of a business you you take a view on what the the, the kind of future returns are like to be not not the total return from when you first invested and you've always got to try and make that trade off between what you think the the, the, the uh, yes, it may be de-risk because you know the business better and uh, and, and you've built a relationship with the management team. But the, as the returns start to moderate, there are, there are often better opportunities with with greater upside with the appropriate level of risk elsewhere. Yeah. And so we, you know, in a concentrated portfolio which is high conviction, you've got to make that trade-off all the time. And you know the process we we, we go through is to really try and build conviction um, in in the positions that we take by doing the. the not not just doing loads and loads of due diligence. I always think it's slightly absurd when you know, some 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 participants in the market sort of make a virtue of the fact that they spend six months a year doing DD on a company to, you know, and to, to, to sort of turn every stone on it. Yeah, you know, by that point you've often missed the opportunity. So I think that yeah. the, the, you know, what you've got to do is, is be really clear about the key judgments that you're making in, in your investment case. Be really clear about what the key risks are going to be, which will derail your thesis. And then focus the DD that you do on 
validating those points and that's how that's what we use our our network the experts that i talked about earlier yeah. on is so if i if i can see that there's, there's there's three or four key things i need to be really comfortable about really confident about how can i do that quickly well i can go and find someone who's a real expert in that in that area or you know, is, a, is, a, is somebody who buys and sells companies in that space and, and really understands what, what trade buyers are looking for, private equity are doing in that space. If we can really distill down the judgments into a few things and then try to try to validate those with people who know more than we do, that builds our conviction. Uh, and and, and that, that, to me, that de-risks the, the, the investment. That's, how, that's our process. That's how we, do, yeah. how we sort of just go about trying to de-risk. And you know, if we can get... You know, and if we if, if we find out new things or find out new risks, then then we, we might not invest or we do more work. But um, you know, we, that doesn't need to take six months. That can take mm. quite a short period of time if you know the right people and you know and you know the right the right questions to ask. So that's yeah. how we can focus it. So you know, Alliance Pharma, great company, great great return. But you know, do I think do, do I do I think the things we've invested in uh, with the proceeds are higher risk? No, because we've done the work to, to convince ourselves that it's the right balance. Yeah. So where have you put the money then, Ken? Where have we put the money? Um, <laughs> are you like, you're allowed to tell us, or is that, or it's going to be announced shortly, or whatever? Well, I mean, yeah, I can, I can, I can tell you the, the sort of key, the key holdings that we have in 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 yeah. SEC. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we've got uh, the the biggest, the two biggest holdings in the trust are uh, Medica, which is a sort of uh, outsourced tele radiology business. Oh, okay. You've added um, to that, have you? Med- yeah, we've, we've, Medica, we've yeah. added to that recently. Um, over the last year, and, and the other one's XPS Pensions, which is a oh, okay. uh, actuarial consultancy business. So, but yeah. both of those, both of those, sort of fit the, you know, I guess you know, what do we like about businesses? These are capital-like businesses, so they're they're, they're profitable, they're growing, uh, they they generate significant uh, uh, free cash flow, um, so they, they've got good quality business fundamentals. Um, and in both of those cases, we are the largest shareholder in the company. So. Sort of leveraging the investment trust structure that we have, so that and the, and the liquidity advantages that, that that gives you to be able to take big stakes in, in businesses, and then um, you know, our, our strategy is to engage heavily with the management teams of those businesses to um, you know, where where relevant, to try and support them with their strategy, um, and make introductions to people from our network that can help them if that's relevant and, and they're open to it. So um, with, with with Medica, we have is is a business which um, you know, we think is playing into you know, again. It's just that sort of structural theme of, of pharmaceutical outsourcing, you know, healthcare yeah. services. Um, you know, they're a specialist. That they're, they're they're meeting an unmet need in in in, in the NHS in the UK, where you know, there's a, a shortage of qualified radiologists, and they they have access to 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 be able to provide the service, which otherwise there's a big backlog in the NHS, and that's sort of being exacerbated by by COVID. And then they've also acquired a business which you know, where we, you know, as, as the largest investor, sort of provided cornerstone capital to them to to fund it. Um, of a business called Rad MD in yeah. the US, which is taking the same core skill set, which is uh, access to radiologists and the ability to interpret scans for for for, for, for uh, different clinical reasons. And but that's being applied to the drug discovery and the and the um, clinical trial market, which we think is a really you know, exciting market, which has got some really good structural tailwinds to it. So they're taking a core skill, they've got, they've got the core NHS business where the market, they're the market leader in the UK, and they're applying the same infrastructure technology and, and capability, but, but now into the clinical trial market, which is global, and it's growing, and it's growing really rapidly. So um, we think it's got a fantastic growth opportunity over the long run, great management team, um, really clear strategy, but then importantly, because we've got this sort of uh, capability and, and, and touch points in the private markets, you know, we're able to validate that private competitors and private and similar businesses with similar characteristics in the healthcare services teleradiology market are you know, they're transacting in the private equity market for significantly higher multiples than Medicare is trading on in the public market. So we think there's a real arbitrage there, which yeah. we'd expect the public market to to uh, recognize over time as the, as the business delivers and as, as it sort of, uh, you know, delivers the growth that people that, that we're expecting. But if it doesn't, then I think it's vulnerable to, to uh, approaches from private equity who, who will sort of spot that arbitrage and, and try to exploit it. So you know, our, our, our plan A is it stays a 
public company and it delivers its forecast it probably has earnings upgrades it can continue to make bolt on acquisitions it can grow grow really rapidly and make, make, make very attractive returns and it will get re-rated but if it doesn't get re-rated then you know, there, there's there's other ways of sort of uh, mm. closing the gaps in the private market comparable yeah it's i need notice it's still only on about just over 16 times per but for yeah. a sort of fast growing med tech type of business then that's pretty cheap just one on that um on the medica side of it yeah. what is the danger of sort of like any of the large big sort of other new operators because i know apple is putting billions into healthcare and likewise with google and stuff doing um AI to be able to yeah. uh, do sort of like um, <clears throat> radiology um, <clears throat> uh, sort of a diagnosis just using yeah. computers. And I know Google's, I think their AI uh, arm has been able to beat the accuracy of in humans when it comes to diagnosing on the right. What is the, what, what is the, the, the risk that their business model gets uh, undercut by really technology and just billions have been poured into this, into particularly to radiology, um, telemedicine, yeah. AI diagnosis. No, I, I, I think I, my personal view is that AI is an opportunity rather than a fundamental threat to the business. Um, right. I think you know, it's been it's been a question mark, and there's been some market commentators who have who have sort of suggested that the medical's business could be fundamentally the business model could be undermined by AI progress. But actually, you know, I don't see it that way. I think. Yeah, they they are a platform that you know, is effectively an intermediary because of the, because of the market position they've got, the customer base they've got, the touch points with the NHS that they have, mm-hmm. which is you know, it's not just one organisation. The NHS is a sort of federation yeah. of multiple organisations, and they you know, over many many years have built that built that capability and that and that um, that trusted sort of uh, supplier status, and and that and, and that gives them the opportunity and the access to the data sets which uh, can allow in. AI vendors who've created an algorithm to do something, access to be able to train their algorithms and, and potentially sort of use those tools to, to, to sort of make the process more efficient. So, you know, I, I don't, you know, and I think we're, we're a really long way away from the, the, the regulators just leaving it down to a machine to, to diagnose somebody. I think, um, you know, th- th- there's all sorts of ethical pro- problems with, with doing that. And I think, um, it's it's highly unlikely to happen anytime soon, i.e. over the next sort of several years. So, um, if if ever. So, what, what I think you get from AI and machine learning techniques that can be a technology that can be applied to this market is you significantly improve the productivity of of um, radiologists and enable them to, to to kind of get through more. And you know, that's extremely desirable in the case of the NHS at the moment because you've got a huge backlog of, mm. of routine scans to be interpreted because of COVID. And, the disruption and resource constraints that the, the organisation has been under. So, you know, Medica are already um, sort of partnering with with AI companies. So some commentators suggest that they should be investing themselves in, in building IP. I really don't agree with that. I think this is a capital like business model. You can spend a lot of money on developing an, an algorithm which mm. only has one sort of specific yeah. point solution. This is a services business that can utilize other people's technology to, to, to improve their service. And because they're the market leader, you know, they're very well placed to be able to be that conduit. So you know, I'm, not, I'm not worried about, about the money being spent. I think that other people spending the money and mm. them sort of be able to, to act as a, a kind of bridge to that being utilized effectively, I think is a real opportunity for them. Because they can actually really drive, yeah. drive sort of accelerated growth for them. So, Okay. And then another one which has got sort of a good um, sort of like secular growth tailwinds, ESG in particular, is, is Music Magpie. And they listed about a year ago, I think. Yeah. Uh, and they do sort of like um, they, they do refurbishment of all things, electrical devices, smartphones, laptops, PCs. Yeah. But they also sort of resell books and stuff. And I know yeah. you talked about their rental business last time. And that seems mm-hmm. to be going from strength to strength. Plus their kiosk business in, uh, in Asda has been rolled out as well. So yeah. so well spotted. And I would highlight to investors is that the shares haven't moved since then. So do you want to give us an update on Music Magpie? Because it seems to be increasingly the, the underlying value of the business is going up, but the shares haven't moved. Yeah, no, I think I think they've they've probably suffered um, in, in the, the 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 e-commerce sector in mm. in aggregate of which the, I guess they're they're a component um, yeah. has you know has derated significantly on the back of some high-profile profit warnings plus you know, some supply chain disruption and, and such like which 
uh, it's been a very real sort of fundamental kind of headwind to, to, to a number of participants in that, in that kind of wider sector. So I think that's not helped them. Um, but you know, they, on a relative basis, they perform well compared to that 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 sector. Mm. Um, yeah, th th this is a business that you know, I remember I invested in a company a few years ago called Regenesis, which was sort of doing yeah. mobile phone recycling, and, and you know, that that was about you know, ha having relationships with with uh, the likes of the mobile phone companies or car phone warehouse or whatever, and, and, and getting access to, to to the returns, and then refurbishing them and then selling them off to, to, to uh, developing countries where they were prepared to sort of take uh, models, so sort of two or three behind the, the ones in developed countries. I think it's, it's evolved massively since then. And in, in, now in developed markets in the UK and the US where they, they operate particularly, people are prepared because of the, the sort of cost of a brand new iPhone or something, they're, they're prepared to have a, a an as new one or two generations sort of uh, uh, behind the, the, the most leading edge ones and paying a slightly moderated price for that. And I think you know, on top of that, people are more conscious about the, the, the sort of circular economy and, and, and mm. you know, not just leaving bits of sort of uh, potentially polluting um, metal and plastic in, in their drawer, but actually um, you know, do, doing something positive with them and then getting a bit of money back off. So I, I think they're doing something which is very on trend. Um, I think they're doing something where they're, they're, they're actually transitioning their business model from transactional to recurring because of this, this idea of the rental model. And mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, I think they can become, you know, they, 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 it wouldn't surprise me if they end up becoming an MBNO type, uh, sort of actually reselling the service uh, offering as well as, as well as the renting the equipment. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that their distribution has expanded. They're, they're, they're growing in the US. The, the, the Asda kiosk that you mentioned just gives people an easier way to, to, to interact with them. Um, and I think they're scratching the surface in terms of the, the opportunity set there. And I, I just think the market is, you know, is, is, is looking at them relatively superficially as a, as a, just a, a way of transacting, selling old phones and buying, buying sort of, Referred ones a bit cheaper than you buy a new one, and, and they don't really understand that business model and quality of earnings transition they're making, which I think should make them much more valuable over the long term. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I you know I think they're in a perfect sweet spot, particularly with sort of like the ESG and uh, you know with uh, yeah. with with if they get a mobile phone handed back to them, which is you know let's say fifty quid, and they can rent it out at sort of like a tenner or or twenty quid a month. I mean, it just the, the business model is just fabulous, isn't it? It really is really good. Another one which has got sort of like um, interesting sort of secular tailwinds you talked about was Truefin, um, which does sort of gaming and fintech. And they've got that ongoing trial. I know it was one of their yeah. subsidiaries, Sakargo, Sar with um, yeah. with Lloyds, et cetera. And it's an unbundling play. And again, the shares haven't moved at all, largely because of the market, I think. But uh, again, yeah. the, the value of that business seems to be increasing by the day. Um, do you want to take us through that one? Yeah, no, I think so. It's a business that's got got four components to it, um, all in, in in different ways, and with a technology underpin to them. But they're but but, but sort of lending businesses. So, um, and the interesting sort of bits of it. For, so for me, the, the kind of really exciting business is Playstack, which is the, the sort of um, the, the mobile and, uh, and and gaming business. Which yeah, I'll come back to in a second. But um, I think the reason why the shares haven't Really performed, as you say, it's a it's a sum of parts play. Um, there was a major shareholder, Aragrass, who had sold down their stake. They they back the business sort of. Uh, it was in fact, truth, it was a spin out from, from a fund that Aragrass had, had uh, focused on fintech, um, and uh, that that was sold down in two tranches to institutional investors, and we we participated in that. Um, the, the the investment case is effectively that. Most probably, three out of the four businesses will ultimately be exited for, for value, which uh, at the time when we first invested, we thought could, could easily be more than the current market cap, um, leaving you with Playstack, which we think has got a really exciting growth story. I think the reason why the, the shares have, have sort of drifted has been um, that the Satago business that you mentioned, which has been doing a big trial on the noise, potentially be. Uh, one of the key sort of underpinning of, of their SME business offering, uh, business banking offering. Um, it's been in this trial, which which everyone hoped would turn into a full scale 
sort of uh, commercial um, contract and you know, potentially ultimately would lead to the business being either acquired by Lloyds or being acquired by, by, by one of the other high street bankers and sort of stymie the competition. Um, that that trial has been elongated much longer than we, we, thought, we thought it would have um, you know, returned to commercial contract by the last, last summer and it keeps being delayed. The reasons for the de- delay sort of feel positive because they're actually expanding the scope mm-hmm. of the trial. So the, the, the size of the opportunity should, should it go from trial to contract uh, sort of feels like it's, it's larger, but there's uncertainty around that. So the market is sort of not giving them the benefit of the doubt until until they see the sort of so, to, until they see the RNS saying that they've got the contract. So you know, everything I hear is, is that things are going well, but you never know until until they've actually sort of signed on the dotted line. Um, mm. and banks banks move slowly um yeah but the really exciting bit is 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 play stack and i think that's you know it, it's a, a game as publisher and developer but it's also a an, an invoice discounting platform for games developers to be able to to monetize receivables from sort of blue chip institutions like apple or google mm. um and then turn and, and then turn those back into customer acquisition costs, which add subscribers, which is a higher return. Then and and, and uh, PlayStack sort of sits in the middle of that, sort of enabling them to to facilitate that that, that invoices. So they're providing sort of the opportunity to, to for developers to develop the games on their on their platform, but also to sort of get access to capital to, to grow capital, those yeah. games more more quickly. Um, and, you know, I think we, everyone knows that. Gaming is is mm. now bigger than Hollywood and bigger than the music industry put together, yeah. et cetera. So you know, this is this is a huge growth area, growth market, and this is a really innovative platform. And actually, it's pretty difficult to get. Um, and, and the other thing they do is is um, allow the developers to monetize their the games through app, through in game advertising as the other part of the platform. So it's uh, it, it's allowing advertisers to access a demographic which is quite difficult to access through a medium which is extremely engaging and then and doing so in a way which is sort of has limited friction so it's not it's not really invading the, the experience because of the way they do it so um you know, again that could be really really exciting just in its own right that could be really exciting as a, as a, as a proposition even if it wasn't for the, the, the games they're developing plus the impulse discount is quite fine as well so you know, on its own i think place that could easily be worth the market cap of the business and then you've got this sort of free option on the other three businesses that they, they are worth something and will probably be divested in, in due course yeah well it's got, probably got that um, that metaverse as well hasn't it sort of overlay if it could get into in-game and stuff get that trendy sort of like you've done the big big data ai but also get we'll probably, they'll probably get metaverse uh, in there as well um now one just coming more close to home that has been a bit bashed and again has knocked the ball out of the park in terms of uh earnings is Belvoir Holdings which is a sort of UK property uh, yeah. franchiser and uh, I mean I was looking at the numbers and it's trading on less than 13 times uh, price earnings ratio and um, because it's got a big lettings business and it's a franchise business it seems to be pretty much immune to even if the the actual housing market itself took a bit of a dip it would still do pretty well I would have thought. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, probably not immune is probably putting it slightly strongly, but I, I think yeah. you know, Belvoir's business we've we've been a long long standing investor in. You know, it's a core holding in our multi cap income fund, um, and it's got it's got the characteristics we, we really like. And although it's in the in the the, the property sector, which is cyclical, um, it's got specific characteristics about it which we think make it more resilient and, and uh, less cyclical than, than most other businesses in that space. Um, so, and you've rightly pointed out one of them. So, um, you know, it is skewed to letting. So, it's, mm. you know, it, it does have exposure to to housing transactions through through uh, stay into sales, but it but it, the, the bulk of its business is in the lettings side, which is a you know, much more steady business, is recurring in nature, and um, therefore much more predictable. So, the quality of earnings of the business is is, is really good compared to most state agency businesses. The second component of the business we like is the fact that it is largely a franchise uh, model so they are they are a master franchisor um supporting franchisees that are uh, you know, so it's the franchisee that, that uh, has the physical premises and, and fixes and fittings and the computers and everything that bears the capital and invests the capital there um, and what belvoir provides is the, the marketing support the brand the know-how that enables those businesses to operate so uh, whilst 
in any franchise business, the, the underlying health of your franchisee is critical. You know, they, the franchisees ultimately have to make money over the long term, otherwise you don't have mm. you know, the franchise isn't very, very valuable. But um, they, they've proven they can they can do that over the long term. Um, and so it's a capital like business model that's very scalable. So they're, they're, they're a pretty major player in, in the UK letting agency uh, sector, but without having had to deploy the capital on the physical premises to be on every high street across the country. Um, mm. So they, those two characteristics, the, 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 the quality of earnings or recurring nature, plus the low capital intensity of the franchise model, means it's a very cash generative business model, which means that even though they've been able to grow material, they've been able to, to pay a really healthy dividend over, over the last few years. And importantly, as they've grown, they've been able to pay a growing dividend. And even, in, yeah. even in the pandemic, you know, when they're hunkering down and uh, the housing market sort of froze over and, and there wasn't much activity, even then, and uh, they they did suspend their dividend from, sort of temporarily during the early part of 2020 because they didn't know what was going to happen and how the business would react. But once things reopened a bit and the housing market transactions proved to be sort of pretty buoyant, they reinstated their dividend and they actually even paid a catch-up dividend so that they sort of mm. basically compensated shareholders for the dividend they missed the, uh, the height of the pandemic. So you know, it just goes to show that it's a very resilient business. You know, that, mm. that, um, and, it's, and you know, volatility in, in, in housing transactions is not the main driver of what they do. Yeah. And then just got a couple of sort of reopening plays. I mean, one which I hadn't, we didn't talk about last time, which is again coming to it's almost like deep value territory, is, is Hostel World, which is a sort of global online travel yeah. agent, sort yeah. of like for booking for ho- or hostels, basically. People travel as backpackers, I guess. And uh, yeah. I just saw uh, it's on... Um, it's on incredible. Again, it's on about 12 and a half times um, PER for if you look at sort of like uh, 2023 estimates. So if you, if you assume, of, you know, the rat reopening play, I mean, obviously, it's been pretty much hammered during the uh, during the lockdowns across the world. And it'll have a sort of like, you know, a mixed this year. Not well, probably a very good second half in, in summer. Um, as people return to traveling. How do you view um, Hostel War? Because it, for, for longer term views, it looks like a... Um, Looks like a perfect play. Yeah, look, I, I, we think it's a high quality business, really high quality CEOs at, at Expedia. Um, we, we, we own this in, in, in SEC, our, our investment trust. Um, mm. you know, it, as you rightly say, it's been <laughs> online travel has not been a, a great place to be during the last <laughs> last couple of years, given given um, the, all the travel restrictions, which really yeah. massively disrupted their business. Clearly. Um, yeah, we, we we participated in a, a sort of recapitalization transaction uh, where they raised money in, in 2020, um, which you know we we felt was the right thing to do to give the business some runway to sort of see see through the pandemic because we felt that the, the, the proposition you know, they are they are a leader in in a, in a, a sort of niche niche but global mm-hmm. but but a niche part of the travel market, um, and. And we think they've got a real right to exist. They, they are they, they they're catering to a very specific market. They understand that market very well, um, and you know, they understand the demographic. They've got a very sort of attractive model for, for acquiring customers in that space. It's just that they haven't been many customers in that space for the, for the last couple mm-hmm. of years for obvious reasons. So you know, we we felt they 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 raised equity in 2020. They then um, they they then raised some some convertible debt. Um, which is basically giving them a runway through to, through to well, well into next year, um, and you know whilst activity levels have picked up, they're still nowhere near where they were sort of pre-pandemic, in, 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 because of for obvious mm. reasons. It's not it's not just about UK. I mean, it's an, it's an Irish-based business, but it's not about UK and Ireland. It's also about which destinations you can go to and kind of disruptions across continental Europe and, and further afield as well. So uh, it's probably been a more protracted um, sort of recovery than. You know, say UK you know, on the beach or something, like a, a, a mm. UK package holidays into into Southern yeah, Europe. Okay. Um, nevertheless, we, we think it will recover, and uh, we think the, the balance sheet is sort of you know, sufficiently strong for them to, to be able to, to kind of trade through that the, the, the discontinuity. And in the meantime, they've you know, put a lot of attention onto some of the projects they won't go there and take anyway, just focusing on. So improving the technology platform they've got, the digital marketing capability they've got, just and so looking inwards to make the business more efficient. So when they do emerge and when things recover to where they were, 
they should be a more profitable business able to grow more, more, more scalably than they, they could historically so mm. we we think it's worth sticking with it um uh, but you know, it's it's probably yeah. the risk it's probably the riskier end of our, of our portfolio for obvious reasons right and who do they um compete against is it like of ebookers and people like that yeah so, so i mean yeah the, um booking.com is the, is the biggest yeah okay is the biggest com- competitor um who, who bought a couple of businesses specifically focused on hostel work uh, on hostels but you know, they they're a pure play only serving that demographic booking.com serves everybody because it's a massive yeah, okay. so yeah, they, we think they've got the ability to be more agile and and just to 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 really uh, to, to to not just provide the accommodation but provide the whole experience and that, mm-hmm. that's kind of how they're differentiating themselves from booking.com who, who just aren't set up to be able to do that but they, they um yeah, and i think there's room for both yeah and then another one, which is a reopening play, but um, in sort of like um, vehicle credit or recovery, credit hire, et cetera. And it's sort of like um, it's got an outstanding, I think, VW emissions is, is um, a Nexo. Um, that's yeah. ticker ANXO. Do you want to take us through yeah. that one? Because I, I think they're on about uh, eight times PR, I think, for this year, which is yeah. unbelievably cheap. Yeah, no, this, this is a, a really high quality um yeah, quite a niche business <laughs> doing mm. sort of uh, yeah, effectively credit credit hire, but sort of in in house uh, legal team. And um, I, I think the business has been a bit unloved over the last few years because there were concerns about, um, I don't know, in, in common with other businesses in, in, in similar businesses in, in this space like Ready and, and the price of the merger with Northgate, where yeah, because of the the, the amount of working capital that gets locked up in, in some of these long-term insurance claims mm. um, as, the, the, as the business grows it consumes cash and, and there was a sort of question mark about their ability to to generate cash um so you know, we, we we took a stake in the business having um gone up and done a site visit with with you know, an expert from our network who had been chairman of a similar business that was backed by private equity we got a real sort of sense of the, the level of control and granularity of how they manage the, the the business, and so we got comfortable about that that sort of cash generation point, and that genuinely it was being locked up because of sort of you know, positive reasons in terms of, of, of the, the opportunities and the growth of the business. Um, we, we encouraged them to sort of rein in the growth temporarily in order to demonstrate their ability to generate cash from mm. the core business, which they they did, and uh, that that gave us and I think others in the market a lot of confidence. But then clearly the pandemic. Uh, dented the, the the progress and the growth of the business because um, there were less vehicles on the road, less less claims, mm. and therefore less activity. Um, you know, it's, an, it's an entrepreneurial management team, so they've been able to to pivot their business. They they um, they've got involved in the the VW emissions yeah. uh, claim, so they're, they're they're sort of running class action. Um, Easel gate, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. No, but but you know, they they've raised money explicitly to to fund. You know, this is a, there's a totally separate yeah. business line where you know, th- they are helping individuals who own own VW and Audi mm. cars t- during that period and diesel cars in that period to to to, to make claims to, you know, on a no win no fee basis. So that, so the activity can get it so to the model where there's working capital that gets absorbed in working progress, but you know, where there's a pretty high high chance of success and where. Uh, you know, there's very significant profit to be made out of doing that, and, and you know, there's potentially an ongoing business from uh, other other automotive manufacturers who have engaged in similar activities, and just to sort of slightly behind behind VW in terms of the sort of status of some of the claims against them, and Mercedes being one of them. So, um, you know, that that's a that's a really significant source of profit and cash for the group in the relatively short term. Um, you know, we would expect that probably to be settled. By the summer of this year, which can, right. you know, which will be a material cash inflow to the business, which can then go to, to fund you know, other other growth initiatives that they, that they have. So, for example, in um, and there's a, there's a new sort of opportunity that they've got in um, you know, areas where people yeah. claiming for claiming for dis, disrepair in in, 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 in housing, housing etc. Yeah. Okay. And then I'd be remiss for me just to sort of like conclude not to ask you about some sort of special situations or. Uh, 
you know, areas that maybe have, have, have fallen on hard, even even harder times is um, is Acrol and um, Roslyn Data Tech. And I know we talked about Roslyn last time. Yeah. Do you want to take us through both of those? Because I mean, the shares have just been flattened on on both of them, and it's sort of yeah. priced to both of them are priced to destruction. I think. Yeah. So in, in, in the, 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 I have quite different views on each of them. So yeah. Uh, 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 what what one, one uh, positive one negative? So the uh, Acrol is an investment we made um, in 2020 when they raised money to, to make it make it sort of strategic. It's a tissue yeah. manufacturer, isn't it? Toilet yeah. tissue. And yeah, stuff, toilet, toilet, toilet tissue manufacturer. Yeah, um, and um, you know it it, it competes. It, it it it's done really well over the years by aligning itself with the discount retailers that are out in Lidl um, and you know, effectively gained market share as those businesses gain market share um, by providing own, own label products to them. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's positioned well in the market. Um, they, you know, they have their own manufacturing uh, uh, facilities and they, uh, but they don't have their own paper mills that like some yeah. of the competitors are. So they le- have less capital tied up in, in infrastructure, but instead they, they, they import the paper reels, the master reels, um, which have been an advantage to them until Relatively recently, when um, you know, the, the, the commodity prices sort of have got shot through the roof, and their input costs have, have, have really sort of come mm. under significant pressure. Now, when, when we invested in business, we knew this was a risk, but we we felt we'd sort of worked out that it was mitigated because of the way that they structured their contracts with their suppliers and with their with their customers meant that they they had the ability to pass on cost inflation mm. um, and. The, the, the way that the, the kind of timing of their contracts was structured was that there was sufficient lag between any input cost, cost increases and their ability to pass on that they that, that they weren't going to get caught in the middle. Um, of course, the you know, recent events have, have sort of exposed the fact that that, that wasn't quite as robust yeah. as we anticipated. Um, and, it's, and the biggest reason is that so the, main, the two main input costs are, are effectively pulp, paper, and, yeah. and, and, then, and then energy. And the energy is the energy component, which has really, really hurt them because their suppliers effectively have had such significant uh, energy cost increases that they were unable to continue to trade unless they could pass on very material price increases much quick, more quickly than the contracts suggest they should. So they're effectively on the phone saying, you, know, you need to take this price increase or we're going to go bust and then you don't have any product. Yeah. So, so they had to take it, but they have not been able to pass on those price rises to Aldi and Lidl um, and, and other supermarket customers with with the same uh, so the same pace, and so they're they're sort of caught in the middle of this you know, negative operational gearing on profit and 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 impact on cash. And the business you know, it does have financial gearing as a result of the acquisition they made. So you're in a position where you've got operate negative operational gearing and financial gearing, and that's that's quite mm. quite Difficult worrying. To manage, yeah. and, and, and and but it's also exposed the fact that you know, the ability for them to pass on. Price increases to their customers is not as clear cut as we as, as we anticipated that it was, and we we thought when we first invested. So we've actually fully exited Acro quite recently in the last few weeks um, on the back of sort of a, a deep dive re-review on the back of the profit warning, and yeah. uh, just just concerned that actually they're one profit warning away from problem with the bank, um, and. You know that might not happen, but if Putin does yeah. invade Ukraine, and I'm wrong about, about yeah, that, yeah, with the energy prices, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty yeah. possible. You, so. raise, you raise a very good point because the risks at sometimes just get too much, don't they? Even if the shares have knocked down, and we had that classic um, even yesterday. I think Studio Retail came out with a profit warning two, two or three weeks ago, and they didn't look in financial distress. And then all of a sudden, yesterday's announcement was that they're going into insolvency because uh, their banks wouldn't actually. Um, Give them the extended to another twenty five. Yeah, yeah, so you're exactly right. Fortunately, I'm, I'm sort of now old enough to remember sort of the, uh, how how things played out yeah. in the dot com crash and the, and the financial crisis. Financial and you, can crisis. See, you can see how things can, can turn pretty rapidly, particularly with operationally yeah. geared businesses. So yeah. you know, I, I do. I hope Acro will get back on on the front foot. They can pass things on through their retailers and you know, and and. You know, Profits recover and, and there's no there's no leverage issue, but I'm just not prepared to say that risk at the moment. I think it's 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 it's, it's much too high a risk situation, and we've lost money on that. But 
as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm pragmatic and I, yeah. I try to reappraise things based on what I know now, not what I thought was the case a year or two ago. And, and you know, yeah. now the risk reward doesn't stack up. Yeah. And so what about um, Rosalind? Rosalind Data Tech? Yeah, so look, Rosalind, we think, is fundamental. One, it's a... It's a um, in a good space, isn't it? It's, 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 it's in a good space. It's got good, it's got good IP, so you know, it's got it's got some some a fundamental protection about what it does. Um, it's you know, whilst it's a small business, it does have you know, an attractive business model, and and it's software business. It's and it's a recurring revenue business with high margins. So it's it's not, and it doesn't have those those capital expenditure requirements or, 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 or you know, infrastructure mm. like Acron does. Um, so it's a very, very different situation. We think it's a um, you know, fundamentally undervalued business on some of the parts. Um, it's got 4 million, if you know, it's a 11, 11, 12 million market cap business. Um, it's got 4 million of net cash. Um, and it's got three businesses with, uh, with one is the, the core, and then two businesses, Integrity and Langdon, which between them make about 3.5 million of recurring revenue, which we think. Uh, Conservatively, it's probably worth another six million pounds, yeah, possibly okay. more. So, so with with those two non non core businesses um, plus the cash, we think you get a round about the market cap. Um, and then you've got the core business, which is has been going through a turnaround. The new CEO, which we we sort of backed uh, uh, his appointment, um, and have been sort of supporting with with some of our, our um, network behind the scenes. Um, yeah, we we felt. They needed to look at that business, which has not really been growing, even though it's got good quality IP, good customers, and, and just really reappraise the product market fit and, and go to market strategy, which they've been doing. We think there's, there's every chance that business can get back to, to double digit growth rates. Mm-hmm. And if it does that, you know, it's a what, three and a half million uh, recurring yeah. revenue business. If that, if that starts growing double digits, then you know, looking at private market comparables of, of mm. that type of software business and, and, and which have been valued on, albeit maybe moderated now in the last six months, but you know, EV sales multiples of five to 10 times. Yeah. Uh, you, you, that business on its own could easily sort of more than make up the whole market cap as well. So we think you know, this business is probably you know, half the value it should be, possibly, possibly yeah. less. Um, and you know, there's some execution to be done, but we're, we're pretty confident the current team are now doing the right things and mm. can sort of unlock some of that value. So you know, we're, we're patient. And, you know, I'm not overly concerned about the share price drifting because it's a relatively yeah. illiquid company and yeah. you know, they just need to start delivering. If they can show the growth, I think it will, you know, the, the mm. shares will re-rate quite rapidly. Well, I know shareholders will want you to carry on waving that magic wand, Ken, and make sure they, uh, the, the management team sort of like uh, stay to that unbundling strategy. Hello, we, 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 own, we own, I think, 28% of the company, so we were pretty aligned so with other shareholders to try and make yeah, it work. Yeah, good man. All right, well, thanks very much again for your time, um, Ken. We've covered masses of material, lots of interesting uh, stocks to uh, for investors to run the slider all over. And if uh, anybody investor wants to... Um, contact or, or actually invest in Gresham's funds, where best to uh, to, to, to contact, Ken? I think the, the, probably the best port of call is our, is our website, which is yeah. greshamhouse.com, and there's a, there's a sort of specific page on our on our strategic equity division, which has details of all the different funds we've managed. So we've got three open-ended funds, we've got the, the, the strategic equity capital, and we've got our, our, our venture capital brands as well. So there's uh, there's information on all of those and links to the specific pages for each of them and, and kind of how to go about investing and who to contact if you want to do that. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks for again for your time, Ken, and look forward okay. to touching base in uh, in five to uh, six months. Take right. care. Very well. Thanks for having me. Thanks.